This is Michael Woodward, and this is Season 2, Episode 57 of the Jumble Think Podcast. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1... Welcome to the Jumble Think Podcast, where we interview amazing entrepreneurs who are changing the world around them by making their ideas and dreams a reality. Along the way, these dreamers, makers, innovators, influencers will give you some tips and ideas how you can turn your own ideas and dreams into reality. Our guest on today's episode is Patrick McGinnis. More about Patrick in a moment. On our next episode, I'm going to be sharing some exciting news about changes we're making to the Jumble Think Podcast. I think you're going to love it, so make sure to check out our next episode all about the future of Jumble Think. Now, let's jump into today's episode. Hey there, welcome to the Jumble Think Podcast. My name is Michael Woodward. I am your host and so excited that you've chosen to join us for today's guest. Before we dive into that, I want to encourage you, wherever you like to listen to podcasts, head on over and click that subscribe button. We've made it even easier if you like listening on iTunes or Apple Podcasts. All you have to do is go to jumblethink.com slash iTunes. It will take you right to the app where you can click that subscribe button. Now let's learn more about today's guest, Patrick McGinnis. Our guest today is Patrick McGinnis. Patrick, so excited to have you on the podcast. Thanks for taking time out to be with us. Thank you so much for having me. Now, you are doing a lot. You've transitioned from the world of traditional Wall Street into your own endeavors and doing some cool stuff there. So tell us your business name, role at the business, and what your business does. Sure. So my business is actually called Deergo Advisors, and I do three things basically at this point in my career. Um, I have an advisory business, so I am an advisor to the World Bank on topics ranging from venture capital to private equity all over the world. So I'm actually getting on a flight on Monday to go over to Ethiopia to work on a project there. Um, I also sit on some boards uh, as part of Deergo. So that's part one. Part two is on the side, I've gotten involved in more than 25 side projects, or as I call them, 10%. Um, okay. You know, so everybody uses the word side hustle these days, but uh, I have yeah. my own specific <laughs> kind of definition of side projects. Um, and the third is that I'm author of a book called The 10% Entrepreneur, which is about how to be an entrepreneur without quitting your day job and exactly wow. talking about how to do all these things on the side while keeping your day job. Oh, that's super, super cool. For you, you've obviously worked in the world of finance, you've worked in the world of investments and understanding different investment instruments and how that works for your benefit. You're very entrepreneurial. You've written a book uh, called The 10% Entrepreneur. You're out speaking. You just talked about your trip to Ethiopia. Uh, You're doing so much. But where did this all start for you? How did you know that this is the direction you wanted to go and the area you wanted to invest and the life that you wanted to build. So it was not in the plans. I'll tell you that I, I was about, I was as about as corporate a person as you could find. Um, I grew up in a small town in the state of Maine. My dad worked for the military. My mom worked for local companies and, you know, for probably two or three for her entire career. So I, I grew up in a place where people tended to keep kind of the same job their entire career. And that was, um, somewhat my plan. I was, you know, I came out of, uh, college, worked for a couple of years in wall street and an analyst program, went back and got an MBA at Harvard, came back again and went back into the corporate segment thinking that I would probably work at one job for, you know, 10 years and then move and, and maybe stick it out at another job. That was, that was the plan. And, <laughs> and, and then, um, you know, the best laid plans, uh, yeah. often fall to waste. And so, uh, in 2008, I was working for a private equity firm that was a division of AIG. Okay. And AIG blew up in 2008. The company was nationalized. The company, which was worth a trillion dollar, had a trillion dollar balance sheet, went bankrupt. And wow. my stock fell 97%. Oh, that's crazy. And it was a crazy time. And that really taught me that um, I couldn't rely on a company to give me the stability that I needed in life or that I wanted in life. I needed to find my own pathway. And so that's what I did. I decided to create my own diversified 
career uh, portfolio of activities. And I found my way to that uh, through trial and error. And so here I am today, but it was completely driven by the events of 2008. It's so interesting that often for entrepreneurs, the stories we hear always come back to, you know, I was doing this one thing or I planned on doing this, but all of a sudden an opportunity or situation I had to face uh, put me down an unexpected path. Now, dealing with that unexpected path for you here, you're working for AIG and you you're doing this thing and life situation hits you and you have to adapt. How did you approach that problem? Because I think so often uh, and we're going to get into this more in segment two, but fear is an obstacle. Situations that we face that are unknown cause fear. And for you, I'm sure there was a lot of uncertainty a lot of question marks and just saying, how do I navigate this tricky situation that I'm now in? For you, when the life situations changed and you're you're on this new path, how did, how did you really approach that? Oh, it was awful. Uh, it was, I was, it, you know, now I look back and it, it was a very worthwhile period of time. But to be honest with you, I spent two to three years completely rudderless and I had wow. been very focused. So I was very much the kind of guy who went from one stage of his career to the next in a very um, direct way. I, I never yeah. quite, I was always, um, because I did something different, I was doing investing in emerging markets in Latin America. It wasn't like there were a million people doing what I do. So I always had a hard time finding good positions because there weren't that many. But once I found them, I was very happy to stay in them. And so when it took, came time to reinvent myself, um, I found it very difficult, to be honest. And I mm. found it I felt very lost and my response to that, whenever I um, am in a sort of a, a difficult position or I feel very lost, I, I tend to, um, I go to, <laughs> it sounds very odd, but I like to go to Argentina. Um, okay. It's, I think it's like my sweat lodge. So I, uh, yeah. <laughs> I went to Argentina to kick off. I took a sabbatical. I started okay. that in Argentina. I came back. I took a year off. I had the savings to do so. My brother, who's a jazz musician, told me to get up every day, not knowing what I would do for uh, that day. Wow. Um, he told me to do that for six months, wow. um, which I thought was crazy. And then I tried it. And it allowed me the freedom and the space to think completely different. I really extracted myself from um, what I was doing before. That being said, I actually stayed on as a consultant at my prior job when I quit. So okay. I had some income. I had some income coming in with very little time commitment. And I went to Spain and France and hung out and really took time off. And when I came back, then I spent time with people who I admired and I thought would have good advice and ideas that I could get involved in different projects with. And then I got an office and forced myself to go every day and spend <laughs> time, you know, working. Yeah. Um, until eventually I just kind of strung together a bunch of different projects that eventually coalesced into a business. So wow. it was, I mean, I wouldn't recommend it to everybody because frankly, um, it was very long process, but for me, um, it was what I needed to figure out what I wanted to do next. Well, I think it's interesting because for you, I, I love this story. I know that um, when I went to your website, you, your tagline, I don't know if it's so much a, a tagline, but the way you define yourself as author, entrepreneur, speaker, and explorer. And mm. I love that explorer because so often in our society, we're busy with the hustle and there's a time and season for hustling and working hard, but there's also a time to explore and be engaged with the world around us and not so hyper-focused on, on maybe the career or maybe life situations, but to get away and just explore and discover. You are doing some really cool stuff with this 10% entrepreneur, which we're, I'm so excited to dive into, but for you being that explorer, how does that help fuel the other things? And how does that sense of discovery really open up the possibilities uh, for, for the things you're creating? So that's a really important topic to me. And I love that question because I, um, I never left the United States until I was 20, 
20 years old. Okay. And how uh, old are you now? Just out of curiosity. I'm 42. Okay. All right. So I never, I never went anywhere as a kid, not because, you know, my parents were bad people. We traveled in the U S but yeah. um, we just didn't do that. And we didn't have passports. And we, I once went to Canada, I walked in <laughs> uh, when I was in high school. Cause I was up on the border at a, a this for school. And, um, I walked in and then we were kicked out because we had entered illegally. And, uh, but, and so I, I never went anywhere. And then in college, I spent a year living in Argentina and it was such a transformative experience for me. Wow. I learned a lot about myself. I learned a new language. I made lots of new friends. I really, um, came out of my shell a lot. And so when I came back, I decided to work internationally and I started traveling for work. So my work, my first job out of school had me kind of in between living in New York, but spending time in Sao Paulo and Buenos Aires and Mexico City. Um, and then from there, I was just interested in, in knowing more places. And so I, over the years now, in the last, I guess, 22 years, I've visited um, a total of 87 countries. Yeah. And wow. so I've really gotten interested in personally in just like the idea of getting outside of your comfort zone, going to places that are really um, far from the places that you've been, going to places that maybe you've never even really thought about much. And so I do that now. I, I tend to kind of look at the map and pick a place I haven't been to and just go there. Um, and I'm lucky because with the other things that I'm doing, I get to travel internationally. So it's very easy for me to do so. Um, and I think that I have learned from that is that number one is that the world is um, more, there's more commonality than you might, ima you might imagine in some ways. Right. Um, but there are also, some places are just vastly different than where you're from. And, yeah. and when you spend time, I, like for example, last year I was in a Syrian refugee camp in, in, wow. in Lebanon and the Bekaa Valley. And you see what people are dealing with um, and the lifestyles that people live oftentimes not by choice and what they do with those lives. And then you look at your own life and you see the amount of opportunity that you have. And, you know, you think to yourself, like, what can I could be complaining about here? You know, I have it pretty good. <laughs> right. I think being an explorer for me, you know, you can be explorer in many senses. You can be explorer in the own city where you live. You don't necessarily have to get on a plane, but it's really about taking the time to notice what's going on around you, contextualize it within your own life, and then try to draw something that you can apply to your own life. I love that because so often it's, you know, it's the old uh, phrase, you got to put your, your, yourself in somebody else's shoes, but by traveling and exploring, whether it's in the community around you, whether it's nationwide, whether it's globally, what you really are doing is opening yourself up to new things, new ways of thinking and experiences that inform you on, on things that might be going on in, in our, our specific time of history or in, uh, politics right now or and anything like that and it's it's interesting that those experiences once you're experience the the situation it really enlightens you in a new level where uh the awareness the experience uh, guides you so for you in what you're doing can you tell us how you find significance and purpose and how these experiences are bringing you to a place where you say what i do matters and it's significant yeah i think uh, you, you know, we talk about travel and one thing that I think travel gives you or has given me, I should say, is that I've become a much more uh, clear about where I'm going and decisive yeah. because when you're traveling, you make tons of decisions every day when you're traveling, you got to make a gazillion decisions and with limited information. So it's like yeah. I get up, I walk out the door of my hotel in Cote d'Ivoire. And I have to decide if I'm going to go left or right. Um, yeah. You know, these yeah. it's, it, and then that continues on. I mean, the amount of decisions you make vis-a-vis -a, -vis a normal day back home is, is incredible. And you take risks in a sense, and you, you may not like the outcomes, but you deal with them. There's a lot of, you need to become more flexible and resilient, things like that. And everything that I do in terms of, you know, my book and, um, and stuff like that um, is about building the capacity to make smart decisions that make you more successful and happy and give you more autonomy. Um, which is a big part of what I think makes me happy is the feeling of autonomy that I've been able to build into my career. So that's really meaningful to me. And the second thing is meaningful to me is if you kind of look at my stuff, um, which you have done, and hopefully some of you who are listening will do, you'll find that it's really global in nature. So in my blog, right. I tell stories and I tell stories not about what's happening in New York or Chicago or LA or or Maine, where I'm from, I talk about what's happening in Jamaica, um, or in Myanmar, or in Uganda, um, 
as well. So I try, what's really important to me is realize that we're in a world where content um, has no borders and, you know, right. people will be listening to this podcast all over the world and we need yeah. to uh, tell stories that are relevant to people that are all over the place. Yeah. So good. I love that. For you in this new season, you are, you have the Deergo um, advisors that you're working with. You have the 10% entrepreneur and the endeavors that are your side hustles. Mm -hmm. What's one challenge that you're currently working to overcome in your own business or businesses? Oh boy. I mean, how long do you have? Where's the couch? So yeah. I, can, I can lay down and tell you all of my problems. Um, I would say, okay, here's a, here's one that many people don't think about. So let me give you this one. Um, yeah. These projects, people get involved in projects, you know, investing in early stage companies, being an advisor, maybe starting something. And they think that somehow it's going to be, you know, a couple of years um, mm -hmm. or a couple of months maybe to be successful and to make money. But the reality is early stage ventures take a long time. So the average um, period from series A financing to an exit is seven years. And so wow. one of the challenges I have is being patient and recognizing that these things just take time. And for you in this season, as you're exploring the possibilities, as you're creating all of this incredible content, but also businesses, what's the next big goal you have for your business? So I think in terms of a, uh, for the kind of writing and speaking stuff I'm doing, I'm actually, I'm joining the league. I'm, you know, inspired by people like you. I'm joining the league and um, much of my own podcast. And it's based on, uh, I invented the word FOMO, fear of missing out. So it's called FOMO yeah. sapiens. And it's oh, cool. talking about how you can choose what you actually want to do and find the courage to miss out on the rest. And so that's coming out in late July. And, um, I've never done this before, so it's been a really interesting experience because hosting a podcast is super hard work, So, yeah. as you well know. Um, I do. Because <laughs> people want to talk way too much, and um, you, you have to direct them. So I have been um, – I've taped four episodes so far, and uh, – and it's, that's, you know, I think an exciting opportunity to explore a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Super cool. We'll be back with Patrick McGinnis to dive deeper into the 10% entrepreneur, FOMO sapiens, talk about uh, investment and startups. It's going to be a fun conversation and we'll be right back. One of our heroes, and I think of a hero of a generation, maybe multiple generations, is Mr. Rogers course famous for mr rogers neighborhood and now daniel tiger's neighborhood and he always asked won't you be my neighbor well today i'm asking won't you be our friend on instagram that's where we love connecting with you we love seeing your pictures hearing your stories seeing what's going on in your life and we would love to be a part of your community and you to be a part of ours so swing on over to instagram all you have to do is search for jumble think all one word jumble think and then Let's be friends. We'll follow you, you follow us, and let's be virtual neighbors. Now let's jump into our second segment with Patrick McGinnis. We are back with Patrick McGinnis. Before we dive into the segment, I always like to check how can people find and connect with you because you got so much um, powerful resources. We're going to talk about some of those in a minute, but uh, how can they find and connect with you? So the best place to find me is at my website. It's www.patrickmcginnis.com, and that's spelled P-A-T-R-I-C-K-M-C-G-I-N-N-I-S. If you go there, you can find all of the links to all my stuff like LinkedIn and Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, lots lots of excitement there. And then if you go to patrickmcginnis.com slash buildyour10, uh, you can download a free workbook that will get you started becoming a part-time entrepreneur, or as I call it, a 10% entrepreneur right away. Super cool. All those links are in the episode notes. So if you missed them, just check right below and click one of those links and it will take you right where you want to go. So we talked about before the break, uh, you are launching a new podcast. You also have written a book called The 10% Entrepreneur, uh, Live Your Startup Dream Without Quitting Your Job. Uh, you, we've talked about that you're in investment uh, spaces with Deergo and doing some stuff with emerging markets. Really, really cool stuff, actually. Where I actually want to start is talking about entrepreneurs as a whole. You on your website identify five types of entrepreneurs, angels, advisors, founders, aficionados. And the last one is the 110% entrepreneur. I actually took 
a quiz that you have there. So if you're trying to figure it out yourself and you're listening, there is a quiz for that too. Tell us a little bit about each of those five and how they're differentiated, how they're similar, and what it means for people when they're those type of entrepreneurs. Yeah, so the those are the five types of 10% entrepreneurs. And basically the idea here is that all of us um, can do things outside of our day jobs, but we all are endowed with uh, different quantities of time, money, expertise uh, in terms of the things that we can do. And that that will direct how our time should be spent. So an angel is somebody who invests their capital in entrepreneurial ventures outside of their day job. An advisor is somebody who invests their time um, okay. in, in entrepreneurial ventures. And, and both of those are in exchange for ownership. So this is really about being an owner of something. So, you know, I okay. invest some money, you give me some shares, or I invest some of my time and I get what's called sweat equity. Uh, the founder is somebody who starts and runs a company on the side. Uh, and then the aficionado and the 110% entrepreneur are kind of sub-genres. The, uh, the aficionado is somebody who's a 10% entrepreneur, but uses that activity to get involved in a project that they enjoy and feel passionate about. And the 110% entrepreneur is somebody who is already an entrepreneur and does things on the side. And so those are the five types. And they really, you know, for example, if you have lots and lots of money, but very little time, then being an angel makes sense for you. Being a founder may not. If you have um, limited capa capacity in terms of the money you can dedicate, but you have lots of time, being a founder or an advisor makes sense. And so that's why I have the quiz because it really guides you through thinking about your resources. And um, once you do that, then you can pick something that would be sustainable and where you're most positioned for success. Well, and I love the fact that there's really uh, two elements this breaks down to. The first one is you either have time or you have money or sometimes you have both uh, to invest in, in this space. When defining your journey as an entrepreneur, how can you really assess what you have to invest and then how can you find the right partners to fill out the parts that you don't? So maybe you have time and a great idea, but you don't have the money. Maybe you have money, but not the time. And maybe you have a little bit of money, a little bit of time, and you need to build the rest of the team. How can you approach that to build the right team around you to make that that idea, that dream, that entrepreneurial endeavor a reality? So when you're thinking about your resources, you have to sit down and basically make a plan. It's almost like a budget. And I yeah. give you tons of, uh, in the in the the download that I talked about at again, patrickmcginnis.com slash build your 10, I have all kinds of exercises. There are also a bunch more in the book where you really sit down and have a frank conversation with yourself about what you can afford to do. So I sat down. Okay. And I did a sort of a, a deep analysis of how I was spending my time and how much money I had. And I allocated part of those towards my 10%. And so I knew I could spend, you know, I took 10% of my, my, my savings and I set it aside and that was my money for my 10%. And that was enough to invest in a couple of companies or to start something or to do both. And so all that, you know, is very much driven by just taking a deep dive into what you're doing today and having an analysis of it. In terms of finding the people, what I recommend people to do, and I spent a whole chapter on this in the book, is really to go around and find people who are doing things that you admire and who you respect okay. um, in terms of entrepreneurial endeavors and go and learn from them, sit down okay. with them, um, spend time with them. Or also just go to, depending on where you live, uh, there's probably, and this is something that you can find anywhere today, there are meetups and there are, yeah. there are groups of people who are getting together to work on projects and start ideas. And these are oftentimes tied to universities or to um, local organizations, but uh, they're all over the place. And so if you go and spend time doing this and just spending time with entrepreneurs, you'll get new ideas, you'll find opportunities. And so it's really something you just need to work into your your day-to-day -day life. It's not something you can do in a week or a month. It's something you need to sort of have a sustained effort of spending time and investing. Um, and once you do that, you'll find that you'll be able to find opportunities. So good. And I love that you talk about sustainability because so often with uh, dreamers or entrepreneurs, we rush into things. We're looking for the instant payoff. The, the I'm going to put time in and tomorrow it's going to be that unicorn. It's going to be the next Uber as everyone's saying right now. Mm -hmm. And I love that you're talking about the sustainability and the longer game of entrepreneurship because 
uh, I think often that's overlooked and people miss the fact that entrepreneurship is a lifestyle, not a get rich scheme. Totally. And in fact, my, the 10% entrepreneur and the, the whole approach is like the opposite of get rich quick. It is about <laughs> doing something sustainable over right. a period of time. I've yeah. been doing it now for, um, seven years. Wow. Uh, I have 25 projects. I, you know, some of them have done really well. Some of them haven't, um, but it's, it's a long-term strategy. Um, and I find that uh, there's so much BS around entrepreneurship in the media <laughs> and the way sure. it's presented. And it's sort of yeah. like, if you read like, any of these entrepreneurship magazines, they make it sound like it's it's sort of like Hollywood or something. It's not Hollywood. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. just Hollywood frogly people. Okay. Like this is <laughs> there is there is no um, fast track. Even the most the most successful business I've ever invested in. Well, there's two actually. Um, the the most valuable successful companies I've ever invested in both um, took like seven, eight years to hit their stride. Wow. And they've become multi billion dollar companies. Right. But that that's just how it is. Um, so when you hear people who are selling you that story of overnight success, it just doesn't exist. Yeah. I mean, we hear it all the time in the podcasting space. Uh, we hear it all the time in business startups where it's like the garage startup that is uh, that, you know, within nine months is making a trillion dollars. And there's always a missing part of the story that's not being told. Uh, yes. and, and, and I think that I hope that more people are willing to tell those stories and say, hey, look, entrepreneurship is worth it, but you need to know the, the true picture so you don't give up when it gets rough. Exactly. So for you, you've written this book that talks about this journey. It's called The 10% Entrepreneur. We've talked about that a little bit. Tell us a little bit more about the difference because you, you also have a, a free workbook that we've talked about. How can they utilize the free workbook and then how can they go deeper by using and reading and experiencing the book and what will it help potential entrepreneurs with on that journey? So the workbook uh, is an extraction of some of the, uh, the exercises that are in the book. And so oh, okay. basically what I wanted to do was give people, number one, an easy way to print something up they could write in and use as a guide towards building a, kind of like a business plan. I, I call it the 10% plan, but it's really just a business plan. How are you going to do this? And so it takes mm -hmm. you through some of the critical components of that business plan and teaches you about the five types of 10% entrepreneurs. So it kind of gets you started in the concept and gets you started working on what you need to do in terms of your own homework to be successful and to get going. Now, if you get the book, the book just takes it to a, a much deeper level. I really explore. So it's this is not a book that... Um, uh, it's a lot of business books I found as I, as I read them now, I never read business books before I wrote one. So, um, mine is not like the rest I like to think, but, uh, you read business books and they're like, some like really great idea. It's like, it's like, uh, um, three minutes to, um, to focus or something or like, you right, know, right. You organize your life in nine minutes or something ridiculous like that. And, um, then you read them and they're not, they're, they're, they're not particularly useful or they're just a a, like a really nice idea, but they don't really give you the tools to do it. Mine is very um, step by step. So I introduce the concept in a couple of chapters, and then I have six chapters of just how to do this step by step, step by step. And so if you um, read the book, you will get, you can, and I, I know this now because people reach out to me all the time from, you know, it's been published in 13 languages, right? So I get, I get notes from, all over the place and people wow. tell me they're doing this and so i know that people of all different walks of life have been able to make this relevant and, and pursue this personally and so that's what the book gives you it gives you a, a system really that you can apply to do this in your own life earlier on you were talking about for you taking stock and um, measuring what kind of uh, um, entrepreneur you wanted to be so you've it sounds like you you do a lot more of the angel side you do a lot more of the advisor side in your working with uh entrepreneurs with dealing with these startups not dealing with but choosing to engage with them how do you vet and choose the startups choose the ideas that you want to invest in so i have three rules about that and in fact this is all um 
from kind of distilled into chapter seven of the book, which is, I call oh, cool. it thinking like a venture capitalist. So I, what I tried to do when I wrote the book was really kind of lay out my whole thought process, how I choose different projects I work on. Because now in my career, if I think back about how many ventures I have kind of assessed as a, as an investor or as an advisor, um, it's probably, oh, yeah, 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 I should count this up someday, but <laughs> let, let me assume, let's see, carry the one. Uh, I probably looked at over 500 projects. Wow. Wow. Right. And I've invested in about 25, so we carry one, 35 projects in my career. So you think about that's less than 1%. I have criteria and the criteria, it's probably, it's probably more, I have to do the math, but I would assume, I always think that my kind of rate of sort of end of, you know, percentage would be about one or 2%. So let's back into it and say it's more, you know, it's, it's a smaller number. It's probably in the thousands now, but reg regardless, um, I have three criteria. The first criteria is I must understand the industry well so that I need to be investing in things I truly understand so that I can make okay. an intelligent decision about whether this particular opportunity is attractive. Yeah. Number two, I must know the people well. And that means that I either know them from previous opportunities or I do a lot of research on them and spend a lot of time with them to make sure that they are competent and that we share, um, we share a common vision about you know, how things should be done. And number three is um, I have to feel that I personally can move the needle on this business, either finding uh, additional investors, capital clients, you know, really be able to be a, um, a valuable investor because that means um, if I can do that, then, you know, I probably, uh, it's kind of a double check to make sure that I have the sufficient knowledge because if you don't, if you can't help, you probably means you don't know enough. And so um, those are the three criteria I have. I apply them to every case. And when I break those criteria, and sometimes I do, by the way, when I break those criteria, it's usually the projects that are failures. So by staying true to your guidepost and saying, this is how I make my decisions, you're really leveraging the best of your ability to protect your investment. Whereas if you go outside of that, then you get into the risk margins. Exactly. I mean, let's think about it. You invest in a... Um, uh, I don't want to n name anybody, but I invested in a project that was very early stage. It was a company that was a idea that was kind of clever, but I had no idea if it was a particularly good business idea. Um, okay. I invested in somebody who I knew and I very well, but I had some doubts about their ability to execute, but I did it because of friendship and yeah. it was like the money was gone in like nine months. So, wow. and it's, that was it. Like end of story. I never saw anything back. It's done. So I, I kind of actually, you know, if you had asked me going in what I thought the percentage of success was, I would have said pretty low and I invested for the wrong reasons. And so, mm -hmm. you know, it's my own fault. Wow. And it's so easy to blame everyone else for failure, but it's really powerful when you can assess the situation and really make the observation of what really caused that failure. In this case, you invested in something that you shouldn't have. And I love that you're like saying, hey, that was on me, not on them. I shouldn't have done it. Yeah, you need to take responsibility for your own mistakes. I think if in this world of investing, because, you know, on the other side, on the flip side, when you have success, you're everybody's quick to claim their success. So if I can't <laughs> claim my failures, then I shouldn't claim my successes, right? Oh, that's good. Yeah, I love that. I love that. You, uh, we talked at the beginning, you, you shared about how money and time are the two really determiners of what kind of uh, entrepreneur you can be, what 10% entrepreneur you can be. But a lot of people go, hey, I only have a little bit of time. I only have a little bit of money. I have a nine to five that is actually more like a, a nine to 10. And so my time is limited, but I have a little bit of time. And on the weekends, or they might go, hey, you know, I have a little bit of money, but I don't know about my risk. So I, I have money to invest. It's free money. I'm not worried about that money, but it's not as big as someone that might have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars to invest in these companies. How can they find projects that are right for them? Uh, we hear about microfinancing for third world countries or emerging markets. We hear about, uh, you know, these uh, investments, microloans uh, yeah. for third world countries. How can people find projects that they can invest in that maybe they have an expertise in 
transportation, but not the the resources to invest hundreds of thousands of dollars into Elon Musk's you know latest and uh, adventure and his cars. How can they really still become that ten percent entrepreneur on their terms at their level? Yes. Yeah, so one critical thing to keep in mind with 10% entrepreneurship is you want to only get involved in things that you can affect the outcome. So if okay. you, if you want to, um, you want to be a part of, you want to uh, not be operating by remote control because then if you're kind of operating by remote control, it's hard to learn and really mm. draw lessons out of this. So I always tell people, um, you know, don't, if you want to buy stocks that, that go buy stocks, that's awesome. But you know, <laughs> that that's a great place to put your money, but you have no control. Um, right. with 10% entrepreneurship, you want to look around you in your community or in your circle of friends, in your, uh, circle of colleagues and professional network and find opportunities. So if you don't have a ton of time, the best thing to do is go find other people who are working on projects who you trust and like and are doing cool mm. things that you respect and get involved in some way as a as an angel or as an advisor. Being an advisor doesn't take a lot of doesn't have to take a lot of time. It can be an hour here or there can make a big difference for somebody. And so um, that's what I encourage people to do. Like, there's lots of cool things you could do. Like, example, for example, giving micro loans, and, and I, I that's a very cool way to. Um, to invest some of your money, but that's not 10% entrepreneurship because you pick somebody okay. and they run off with your money and do what they will with it. And chances <laughs> are, you're not really adding a lot of value. Um, right. like buying Bitcoin isn't being a 10% entrepreneur, but, but, um, I have found that no matter where you go in the world, there are always people who are starting businesses in your community around you okay. or in your network that need help. And you can engage that way and you can do it on your own terms. We hear about VCs and they're all often called vultures. We hear about angels and it's a little bit softer, um, but there's some bad reputation that these industries have as uh, being, you know, people that take over the business that uh, destroy businesses and also, you know, are looking at the finances over passion. And so there's all these different things. I guess there's two questions here. One, what is the truth about that? And two, when you're doing the 10% entrepreneur, how can you become an asset through the financial investments uh, versus being a person that comes in and uh, gets in the way? Yeah. So yeah, there is a, um, some people are terrible and there are plenty of investors who do bad things, but usually that's the fault of the founder. Um, because okay. Typically what happens, not always, but typically what happens is first time founder um, gets an offer they feel they can't refuse, ends up taking capital from somebody that maybe isn't the right person, maybe sells too much of their company, loses control, and then they are no longer their own, you know, they have a boss, right? They're investors. They're no longer their own yeah. boss. And oftentimes yeah. they take too much money or too little money or they waste the money. I mean, I think of so many startups that I've gotten involved with, the ones that went poorly were the ones where the founder didn't know what they were doing. They they got investors who didn't share their vision. Maybe they sold too much of the company, so they lost control. They wasted a bunch of money on stupid stuff. And then they're a year into their business. They've spent all the money and they haven't gotten anywhere. Well, you know, tell me whose fault that is, right? Um, right. <laughs> and so in general, I think what I always tell founders is you, you know, raise as little money as you need. And remember, the minute you take on an investor, you now have a boss. And so you need to be prepared that – if you don't deliver, you're going to face some consequences. You know, this isn't like people just giving you money to go off and pursue your passions. This is a business. Right. And right. so um, the way that you avoid problems with that is, number one, you find people who are either are experienced or that bring people around them who are experienced so they don't make stupid deals because stupid deals set the tone for disaster. Mm. Um, and number two is um, you make sure that you deal with people who, who you have common ground with and that, that you know. And so um, oftentimes what happens is people get into a business, they don't have a shared vision of what this business should do. You know, they all think it's, they maybe have a shared passion, but they don't yeah. really, they haven't agreed upon like, okay, what are we going to do if this happens or that happens? So what I do is sit down and I have those conversations in advance. So I really understand what the people um, around the table are doing. And if I don't like what I hear, I just walk away. And I think wow. that's really critical. And so if you don't know what you're doing and let's face it, like we're all learning, but if you say like, okay, sounds great. I have no idea even what questions to ask. You can 
team up with other people. This is a highly collaborative space. You can get involved in angel investment groups. You can learn. Um, mm. Or you can become an advisor, which is you invest your time. And so even if it fails, it's not like you've lost any money. But it's about right. spending time around these people, spending time around these opportunities and learning as you go along. Wow. That's really, really cool and great insights into this. Before we wrap up this segment, I want to talk about the fact that you uh, are attributed to being the person that invented the word FOMO from Boston Magazine. Tell us a little bit about that and FOBO, which is another term, mm. and how we can deal with them. Yes. So FOMO, fear of missing out, FOBO, fear of a better option. The idea that you generate tons of um, options or things you could do and then have trouble deciding amongst them, which is a big problem uh, these days in a world where we have so many choices. Right. And um, I actually came up with these when I was a business school student uh, back in 2003, 2004, up at Harvard. Okay. And I noticed that my classmates were these very successful, very smart people who spent their lives being overwhelmed by the amount of opportunities and decisions they needed to make. Yeah. And so I, I wrote a satirical article in our school newspaper um, <laughs> that eventually was became sort of the basis of FOMO. It, uh, FOMO became this big term that was used at Harvard for the, the next couple of years. And then it was written about by different magazines um, and as this thing that, you know, these business school students have and um, later became more part of sort of popular culture. And so um and so I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about them, and, and it's a, a whole other podcast uh, to, to talk about how to deal with them. But, but basically, it comes down to, in a very simple, if I were to sort of summarize, the way to beat FOMO is to be focused, okay. and the way to beat FOBO is to have conviction and make decisions that um, you feel good about. And so um, a lot of what I'll be talking about on the podcast is how to do those things and talking to people who have to struggle with these in their daily life. I'll tell you something. I I have both of them all the time. I'm terrible. Um, I have FOMO and FOBO right now. Wow. So wow. I'm thinking like, oh, the World Cup is on today. Like I've got to watch it all. But oh, I have, you know, I have all these other things I want to do. How do I choose? And it's stressful. So yeah. it, the more that you can, and I've found my own strategies to overcome them, but it is a, it's an ongoing struggle. Wow. You mentioned the podcast. When does FOMO Sapiens uh, launch and what should people expect? So FOMO Sapiens comes out at the end of July and it's really about um, it's conversations with people who are have learned through experience uh, how to choose the things they actually want to do and how to um, leave everything else to the side. And it's also a discussion about the factors that drive these behaviors. So mm -hmm. whether it's social media or our connected lives um, or all of the other things that we live in our modern age, how, what are the things that drive this and how can we, how do we, can sort of acknowledge what they are and and overcome them. Super, super cool. I can't wait to check it out. Sounds incredible. Before we wrap up this segment, let's remind people how they can find and connect with you. So you can find me at patrickmcginnis.com. That's P-A-T-R-I-C-K-M-C-G-I-N-N-I-S, where you can find links to all my social media, which uh, which has lots of, uh, I think, exciting content. I also have my blog on my website with lots more and lots of practical advice and tools. And then you can also download a free workbook at patrickmcginnis.com slash build your 10. That's build your one zero. Um, and if you go there, you'll get started today on your 10% entrepreneurial journey. Super, super cool. We'll be back with Patrick McGinnis and our rapid fire questions. You've been thinking about that big idea and dream for a long time now, and you're ready to start, but you're not quite sure what you should do next. Well, the team at JumbleThink has worked with hundreds of entrepreneurs, businesses, and even Fortune 100 companies to help turn their ideas into reality. Here's what you need to do. Swing on over to jumblethink.com slash help me. You can learn a little bit more about the services we offer around our coaching and consulting. And then at the bottom of that page, there's a contact form where you can drop us a note. Let's start the conversation and see where it goes and how we can make your big idea and dream a reality. Now it's time for rapid fire questions with our guest, Patrick McGinnis. We are back with Patrick McGinnis and rapid fire questions. Patrick, are you ready for rapid fire questions? Let's do it. All right. The first question is, what is one tip you'd give someone with a big idea or dream and they don't know where to start? Start small. Just do small okay. things and get going. All right. Love that. 
What's one change you'd like to see in the world? Um, ooh, I'd like to see every state adopt ranked choice voting. Okay. All right. Uh, that political. is a topic unto itself. Uh, yes. Massive topic uh, that is definitely being chatted about often. So here is a new question that we are throwing out to some of our guests. We're trying it out. So we're trying it out today. And here's the question. What is one trend you currently see that gets you super excited? Oh, um, activism among um, high school students. What do you want your legacy to be? <sighs> Oh, uh, wow. Um, somebody who um, made their own way in the world and took a different path. Where do you find inspiration? I find inspiration in meeting people who are very different than me all over the world who are doing really crazy, interesting things. What is one book you think every dreamer or entrepreneur should read and why? I love my old standard is the um, I love the Lean Startup by Eric Ries. What is one tool that is significant for the success of your business? Ooh, um, for mine, I'd say speaking foreign languages. What is one habit that is helpful for or helpful in your life as an entrepreneur? Exercise. Okay. Why is that? Uh, it keeps you, it's like it keeps the machine running and it gets rid of the stress. Cool. How do you start and finish your day? I have no, I have no um, particular routine. I kind of do whatever I want. Cool, I love that. If you weren't doing what you're doing today, what do you think you'd be doing? Oh, I would probably be working in a private equity firm. <laughs> Yay! Hello, Isn't everybody in private equity. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, in our final rapid fire questions, what is one dream that you're still wanting to fulfill in your own life? I want to hit a hundred countries visited, so I'm at eighty-seven. So I need. I need 13 more to make that goal happen. Before we wrap up today's episode, we always like to leave our guests have the final thought for the day. So what's your final thought? My final thought is that I see so many people who want to do things that are entrepreneurial outside of their day jobs, and they um, they have many excuses. It's easy to make excuses. It's much harder to just get going. But my final thought is um, I had two people last week come to me and tell me they quit their jobs to do what they had wanted to do after reading my book. Um, they'd started business on the side and went full time. So I'm telling you, if they can do it, so can you. That's so, so cool. Patrick, it's been really fun talking to you. Thanks for taking time out, being on the podcast, sharing your story, sharing about your book, which I think is a very, very cool topic that many of us, I think, need to be exploring. And we wish you the best on all of your adventures as you explore the world. Thank you so much. It was great being here. Once again, we want to thank today's guest, Patrick McGinnis, for taking time out, sharing his story, and giving us insight into the world of being a 10% entrepreneur. In the episode notes, you'll be able to find his links, the link to his guide, his book, and also the book that he recommended. So make sure to check out the episode notes so you can connect further with Patrick. As we wrap up today's episode, I want to encourage you to get out there, do something fun, have a little experiment to try making that dream and idea a reality. You don't have to do big things to make ideas come to reality. Sometimes it's just simple little steps, having fun along the way and seeing what happens. So get out there, do something fun today to see your ideas, to see your dreams become a reality and change the world around you. Tirez-vous doucement, mais complètement En avant, en arrière, sur les côtés Vous êtes une autre personne Les mères de famille, les enfants Peuvent également prendre un moment revitalisant Dans quelques mois Lorsque vous aurez bien saisi la technique et que vous serez maître de votre corps, vous pourrez vous décontracter même en travaillant.